Okay, so um, moving right on ahead here. Um, so uh, as you know, the input modeling report uh, due date is coming up here. Um, not looking for much on your input modeling reports. Again, just one to two pages. I put a couple of example uh, modeling reports online. I think four or five of them from previous semester where those students actually went you know, farther. Um, they probably did, you know, um, gave me more data than I was actually kind of looking for. I mean, the main, it's called an input modeling report um, for historical reasons. Um, I understand that, you know, you're, you haven't a lot of time to go out and do a lot of data collection or, or whatever, but I'm hoping that you've at least come up with a system and a, kind of an interesting research question that you're hoping to study. Uh, you, so your input modeling report really view it as a short project proposal where you're going to tell me what you're going to study, uh, what are the main problems uh, that make that you know, interesting to study. Um, in order to study that, what are the uh, input models that are going to be necessary for you to characterize to build your simulation? What are the decision variables that you plan on playing with um, in that uh, simulation? And what are the output metrics that you're hoping to gather to sort of see if you've made improvements uh, or, or whatever, you know, however the question might be? Um, so, so those are kind of the big things. And then um, if you can at least demonstrate to me that you have the capability of getting some of these. So again, the original spirit of the input modeling report is you would go out and gather some data and then you would fit um, a model to that data and say, look, uh, we've, we're able to find inter-arrival times to this process and it looks like they um, aren't quite exponentially distributed. Um, at least based on our pilot data of these, you know, 30 arrivals or something like that. So, um, so that's, that's kind of this just, it's just a certificate that allows me to see that you are pointed in the right direction and you've started kind of thinking about it. Because the last thing I want is, you know, you know, towards the end of the month, you're just sort of, you know, finally coming up with what you're going to do. Um, I try to have you turn it in this early because I will personally go through and look at every single input modeling report and provide feedback on it. So I'll be able to say, um, you know, this sounds too ambitious or this isn't quite in the spirit of the project and so on. So I want to be able to get you that feedback ASAP. So that's the reason why I asked for it so quickly. So uh, so that's the, the main sort of focus. And then after that, uh, we've got two weeks of normal labs. And then after that, there's no more labs. And, uh, and so those that the time that you would normally devote to labs that week, you can then devote towards your final project. Um, so um, yeah, so this is just the same stuff I was saying about the input modeling report here. Um, and again, I'll just add kind of COVID notes to this. I just posted something on the Canvas site that gives some ideas for if you feel uncomfortable with going out and taking data at, so a lot of times we get a lot of people that like the model just because they're convenient things like banks and coffee shops and fast food restaurants, just happens to happen a lot that every semester we get a lot of those. But you know, this semester you might say, you know, I, I don't really feel uncomfortable with taking data um, inside a fast food restaurant, for example, and uh, for long periods of time. And I could understand that. Um, so uh, I will, you know, be a little bit more flexible on that. So maybe you gather data from the outside of the restaurant and then you go online and you find some information about the average time it takes for someone to make a hamburger or something like that. And then if, um, and, and then you can kind of merge those two. Um, so your model will have all the right components, but some of the data will become from real world data and the other data will come from aggregates that you found online. Or if you um, don't want to go out and actually take data from the out, you know, from you know being at a physical system, you know, um, you know, in the, the real world, there, um, I've put, and this is just an, an example, um, a couple of repositories of these uh, webcams that are aimed at a particular spot in a city, um, you know, in, a, in an airport. 24-7, um, and um, they allow you to observe from that location. So one of those, I think worldcams.eu, I think is the one I link to, it actually has a nice categories. And so you click on that, and then it's got a whole bunch of categories inside there, like airports. So you want to do an operations research project on an airport? Well, here's a bunch of webcams from airports. And so you can see how, how often planes arrive, and those sorts of things. And you can use that as data to feed into your model. Uh, traffic lights and intersections, well, you, you go into that, and you can sort of study an intersection and then try to model the intersection as accurately as you can inside your model and then 
create an alternative model where maybe you say, um, well, I, I want to change the timing of these lights, or I want it to be a scramble intersection where um, all the cars get a red light and everybody gets to cross in every direction for a certain amount of time. And I want to simulate how that might happen, et cetera, et cetera. So these are the types of things that you might simulate and might use data from these cameras that you uh, that prevent or that keep you from having to actually go out and collect the data yourselves. So. Um, so that's that. Uh, and then the only other uh, announcements I have here, um, there's Canvas activity uh, due before the next lecture. Um, so that's been available online. Then after that, there's two more kind of content-based Canvas activities before the review Canvas activity. And then there's this homework that's been online. Um, and there, as I mentioned on Canvas, uh, for the second part of this, if you're looking for extra help on doing the power analysis, which we'll go over briefly in the intro slides today, but uh, there are additional videos online. I posted two videos, one that's kind of like a theoretical video of background on power analysis. You can skip that if you don't think you need it. And then the second one is me working an example that's very, very similar to the example that is part two of the homework. And so you can uh, check that out as well. So try to provide a lot of help there. So that's all the announcements I have. Um, I do, you know, that I've been, I chatted with the TA uh, yesterday about the labs are working on getting those graded. Uh, and uh, there's just a backlog due to an unfortunate event on his side. Um, so uh, we're working through that. Um, so, um, and I've tried to recruit some additional help to get those graded as well. So I know those are out there and uh, we are working on it. Um, otherwise, are there any other questions? Okay, well, um, it is going into Halloween. So, uh, so this is um, last year, uh, I uh, this time was standing in the middle of a lecture hall um, wearing um, this Ghostbusters jacket um, that we, I would refer to throughout um, the lecture. And so, uh, so we, I may end up still using some of those references because it turns out that Halloween is a great time to talk about stats. And so today we're gonna talk a little bit more about stats and where the heck some of these constraints that we've been talking about for these different tests that we need to use come from. So, um, so uh, moving forward with, uh, with that. Uh, you know, so going back to the stuff we talked about yesterday, we, you know, make sure we're, we're getting the lingo right, uh, positives and negatives. Positives are the conventional way to say we've detected an effect, um, and, uh, and negatives uh, suggest that we did not detect a difference from what we expected. So detected, a detection means a difference from expected. So a positive result is you found a difference from what you expected. Um, and so the alpha value, this is the type one error. It's our false positive rate. It is how often we have detected a difference from what we expected when there actually wasn't a difference from what we expected. So um, in the case of ghosts and ghouls, you know, if you are standing on your back porch and you hear some rattling of, uh, you know, of, well, you hear a rattling noise, you could, uh, you know, the expectation would be that it's just wind blowing through a tree. But an alternative hypothesis is that it is a ghost that's come to haunt you. And so um, the if if uh, so the, the question would be is how much noise do you need for you to be convinced that it's not wind rattling through the trees? And so the false positive rate here, um, if you think about it, every time you hear wind rattling through the trees, you run it through a hypothesis test in your head. And the question is, what is your head's false positive rate? And so this alpha value, which is a value you can set in every test, is, is telling the test how, um, how much of a, uh, what threshold do you want it to, to tell you that it thinks it's detected a difference from normal? So in the Ghostbusters case, you know, they've got this, um, you know, we are ready to believe you down here on the bottom of their, you know, on this, this jacket here, if you can sort of, you may not be able to read that, but that's like the, you know, the logo underneath the, the, the Ghostbuster logo is we're ready to believe you. That, what that means is that they have a higher false positive rate, but they have a higher false positive rate because 
um, they're more interested in their type two error. In other words, they are willing to, to count more things as ghosts than probably are because they wanna make sure they catch every ghost. So the downside of having a low false positive rate is you end up rejecting a bunch of things that actually were different than normal. And so, um, so that's kind of where this, this alpha comes from. It's, it's your tolerance for the unexpected. And so uh, in, the, in the kind of language here, we like to, we like to usually use these grids. And so in these grids here, the columns here are the, what's actually going on in reality. So our expectation is true is down this, this left column here, or our expectation is false is down the right column here. If you um, like to view things in terms of the alternative hypothesis, then you can say that down the left-hand column, the alternative hypothesis is false. And in the right-hand column, the alternative hypothesis is true. So these are the um, identical, uh, th these are, are the same things. They're just presented in different language. And we refer to the when the real world is true and we end up detecting from our data that the real world, that, that, that when the hypothesis, so when it's just wind is true, but we end up deciding it's a ghost because it just seemed too loud to be wind then the too loud is your alpha. And depending on how high you set that threshold, it sets your type one error rate. How often you determine that wind that actually is just wind is a ghost. And, uh, and on the other side of that, if um, the type two error rate is when is it actually is a ghost and you instead decide that it is just wind. So again, in the kind of Ghostbusters case, we are here to believe you means that they have, have chosen to redu have a reduced type two error rate because it is really important for them to find every single ghost. And so that's, they'll, they're willing to engineer a hypothesis test that has a low type two error rate, even if it means a higher type one error rate because they are okay with having a bunch of false detections um, just so long as they get all the real detections. So uh, when you talk to engineers versus scientists, what you'll often find is that engineers with very large R&D budgets do not care as much about type one air. They're willing to inflate type one air because they're exploring and they really want to make sure they find interesting differences that could be exploitable um, and, and turned into a profit later. So it's more important for them to detect effects and they're okay that in, or in studies, they might detect an effect that is not a real effect because they know they're gonna throw more R&D budget at it and then later figure out that it's not an effect. In science, you have a very little amount of money and you can't make a claim unless you're pretty sure that it's there. So if you, for example, say that um, drinking coffee makes you smarter, um, you can't just say that without data. And when you have data, you can only say, so the, the null hypothesis would be that drinking coffee does not make you smart, smarter. And so that's what we're expecting. Detecting a difference from that, um, then that's an important thing. And you're probably not going to get money to run follow-on studies. So if you say drinking coffee makes you smarter, you be able, better be able to say that in one study and, the, and so that means your type one error rate is really, really the thing that you're, um, you're gonna stress in science where you can't run these follow-on studies necessarily. So, um, so depending on your culture, you're gonna have a different um, feeling towards this alpha value and this beta value. So I want you to get kind of comfortable with those and know that as you wander between cultures, then you're gonna find different pressures towards one or the other. And there is a trade-off between the two. Now also as you wander between cultures, you're gonna find a difference in language. So sometimes people refer to a positive as actually affirming the hypothesis. So like in a goodness of fit test, like if you say, I think these are exponentially distributed data and okay, I did not reject that hypothesis. You might view that as a positive result. Like I thought they were exponential and they are exponential. That's good, now I can move forward with my exponential assumption. So sometimes people use that term positive to mean that, and it's, it has a valence, it's a good thing. And so a positive result uh, might mean that uh, your hypothesis was true and you failed to reject it. And you might review that as a positive result. This is um, 
far less conventional than the other way around. But you need to think about it depending on your stakeholders, because sometimes you'll have a stakeholder that isn't quite sure about positive and negative. And to them, detecting a difference from expectation, um, that sounds like a negative thing. And so to them, that is a negative result. But to the pure statisticians, it's positive to detect differences from expectations. So just keep those differences in how we use these words in mind. Now I can take all of that from that previous slide and summarize it in this one, which I'll, you'll see, I might use this again in the next uh, couple of lectures periodically. And so I've just taken that grid and I've summarized it up here. Um, so you've got, um, it, it, again, so if you remember on the left-hand side, the hypothesis is true, the right-hand side, the hypothesis is false. So on the left-hand side here, we've got that um, our hypothesis is true. And so the type one error rate is we failed um, is, so if the, well, I think I actually might've flipped these in this diagram here. So what we're, we're saying here is that the, um, the true positive, well, if it's true, then that means that um, I detected positive and the hypothesis was actually positive. True negative down here is saying the hypothesis was negative and I um, have a result that is consistent with it being negative. And then my false positive rate and false negative rate are down here. So I'm just sort of summarizing that those four things that we care about. And then over here on the left, um, then what you've seen here is, and I'm sure you've seen this in 380 or 385, but this blue kind of normal distribution here represents all of the possible um, measurements that you would get when your hypothesis is true. So when the hypothesis of it just being wind in the leaves is true, then the noise that I hear from wind in the leaves is going to come from this blue distribution. So everything under this big blue curve here, this kind of more central normal curve here, represents sounds that are very reasonable to hear if you just get wind blowing through the trees. Now this red uh, or shifted hypothesis over here, this is our alternative hypothesis, and there's just one of many. So there is, there, is, there is only one null hypothesis, but then there are a gazillion alternative hypotheses. And I would just pick one of them like ghosts, then that might flip into this. And so if it were a ghost, then the sounds that you would hear from a ghost would fall into this uh, group over here, this normal hypothesis, or this normal distribution that's been shifted over. And so the problem here is that there's ambiguity, is that some of the sounds you hear from ghosts generate the same stimuli in your ears as sounds that you hear from just wind. And so um, that's what generates the false positives and false negatives. And so um, what the areas shaded in here are colored to match the areas in this box over here. So all of these measurements that are over here are measurements that are representing that are noises that are so different from a ghost that um, you're that you're pretty much always going to uh, uh, you're always going to bin them in with it just being wind the null hypothesis and these ones way over here on the right are noises that are so different from being wind that you are very easily going to just and truly um, going to bin them in with it being a ghost. But these noises in between here, there's some noises that are slightly more ghost-like um, and slightly less wind-like that actually were generated by the wind, but you classified them as a ghost. So that's a false positive. Or there are some uh, noises that are generated by ghosts that are so wind-like that you classify them as wind. And so that's a false negative. And so these areas here come from taking areas under these distribution curves here. And so um, that's how those two things relate. And then by choosing a false positive rate, by choosing an alpha, by choosing a type one error, what you're doing is this middle magenta bar, you're deciding where you're drawing the line between positives and negatives. And so anything to the right of this line, you're gonna call a ghost. And anything to the left of this line, you're gonna call wind. And so if you draw this, move this line way over, then what you're gonna do is you're gonna call fewer and fewer things ghosts um, and, uh, and more and more things wins. And as a, because of that, your false positive rate is going to get smaller and smaller and smaller. So the area that's 
uh, under the blue curve, but to the right of the line is gonna get smaller. But your false negative rate is going to grow because as this line moves to the right, it's then going to sweep out more area that is under this uh, true positive curve. And so, uh, and so there, that's sort of showing how there is a trade-off between false positives and false negatives, or just generally between the type one error and the type two error. And that trade-off, and I'll, I see the question in the chat, and I'll get to that here in a second. And that trade-off here is captured by the so-called receiver operating characteristic curve, which is down here. So if you take any machine learning courses or go on and further uh, work in data science, then you're going to see these ROC curves. And these ROC curves just plot type 1 error on one axis, and they plot 1 minus type 2 error, otherwise known as statistical power, on the other axis. And the diagonal line is what you'd get if you just flipped a coin and, um, and then set a threshold for, um, for uh, so you've, it's sort of like you flipped a weighted coin. The, the weight of the coin corresponds to your type one error. And so whenever it comes up heads, that's when you detect a difference. So you can say, if it comes up heads, then I'm going to say it's a ghost. Well, so if I make the coin biased, so it always comes up heads, I always think it's a ghost. If I make it biased, so it always comes up tails, I always think it's not a ghost. And if I've got it in between, then it comes up randomly, it's half time it's a ghost and half it's not a ghost, but it has no relationship to data. So the coin, the weighted coin, where you're, the weight depends on uh, where you are in the, on the type one error rate is this diagonal line. A good hypothesis test will be bent upwards away from the diagonal line so because it is based on real data and uh, but it still has the general shape here that as you move your alpha threshold out what you're going to end up doing is you'll end up increasing your statistical power so you'll end up decreasing your beta so as you increase alpha you decrease beta and vice versa and that fundamental trade-off comes from this diagram right here all right so that's um you know, that's the, I'm not, probably not going to go into that much detail in this diagram I've ever show it again, but whenever I show this diagram, that's what I'm trying to communicate concisely here is all of these relationships and where they come from. And there was a question to clarify, does positive generally mean H0 or H0 rejective? Yes, positive generally means conventionally in most discourse, positive means you've rejected the null. And you say, well, why is that a positive result? It's positive because you've detected a difference. So the null is like what you just generally expect. It's win. It's nothing special. It's important to detect ghosts when there are ghosts out there. So a positive result says it's a ghost. And so uh, that is why we refer to that as a positive. We're saying it's different than normal. It's, and that's why we refer to it as a positive result. All right. So any questions about the lingo so far. This is sort of the general stuff before we get into the specific tests and where all their constraints come from. I'm assuming all this is review, stuff you've seen in 380, maybe 385. ROC, um, and I can type that in the chat. Um, ROC is the receiver operating characteristic characteristic uh, curve. And you see, where does that term come from? Um, years, decades ago, uh, then when radar uh, became a thing, they would have radar uh, operators and, um, and they would get data, they, they would hear or they would see something in radar. Um, it wouldn't surprise me if this also happened with sonar. And then they'd have to make a, a decision. Do we, does there actually something there or is this just the, the noise we get from normal? And then they would make that decision and then they would be judged on how well they actually did. And so um, that they were characterized by their ROC curve. So your expertise at watching the radar, uh, the data, and then processing it in your mind would turn into a score and how you were evaluated turned into this ROC curve. And so, um, so th that, that was how originally people were evaluated. And so receivers, they were radar receivers, that's where it came from. Now we don't have really a good reason why we use receiver, but it just so happens that this, uh, this mapping type one error against statistical power 
um, just has become known as the receiver operating characteristic curve or the ROC curve. Okay. Okay, so uh, the t-test, which you use on homework G3, and you're introduced in 380. Um, so, you know, I don't know. How, so, how many people, um, out, out of curiosity, and you can um, either raise your hands or put it in the chat. How many people have heard the story of the t-test and where it comes from and how beer is involved? Has anybody heard this before? Come on, give me some indication that people are out there. I know it's stats, but I promise you stats can be exciting and we will try to make it exciting. All right, so I see no's and yeses. Okay, so a mixture. So just as long, I'm glad there's some no's. So that's, uh, that's good. So, um, all right, so cut to say year 1900, around that time. At that time, statistics were only done with large amounts of data in agricultural settings. So you go out to a farm, you plant, hundreds and hundreds of, uh, you know, of, of stocks of corn. And, um, and then if you wanna try a new fertilizer, you plant another you know, hundreds of stocks of corn on a different plot. And you just look at the averages and you say, on average, we got more yield out of one than the other. And you can just look at the averages and you don't have to worry about that because you, you've got so much data. Um, it's sort of interesting is that um, people always complain that like big data people and machine learning data and AI people, they don't have enough statistical background. And part of that is because they're, they're going back to the way it was during these early days of agriculture is that you had so much data, you actually didn't have to worry about stats. It was, it was, the, it was easier because you had so much statistical power because you had so much data. Now, in the industry, um, in Guinness in particular, there was an, uh, effectively an operations researcher, an industrial engineer named William Seeley Gossett. And Gossett, um, is, um, he's there at Guinness, and, uh, and they would like to do um, uh, process improvements in their beer. Um, you know, everything from, you know, you want to do taste tests uh, to see, is this taste better than this? Do you notice any difference in this? Um, and, you know, they want to change um, something, they want to make something cheaper in the factory, but they don't want to see, they don't want that to actually change the quality of the beer. And so um, the question was, in their cases, they didn't want to do large, elaborate experiments with hundreds and hundreds of samples. They wanted to do this with small sample statistics. So they wanted to be able to say, um, can we actually just get, you know, uh, you know, test, you know, 10 bottles of beer against another 10 bottles of beer and make a determination that the 10 bottles of beer on the old process don't taste any different than the 10 bottles of beer on the new process. And so before William Seeley Gossett, you had to do 100 bottles of beer versus 100 bottles of beer because there was so much variance, but nobody cared about that because in agriculture, you could just generate large numbers of data points. Gossett said, we can't do that in Guinness, not effectively. If we want to bring statistics into the industry, we need to do it with small numbers of samples. And so, um, so he came up with the t-test and the t-test was a way to compare averages, even though you didn't have a lot of data. And, uh, but Guinness, uh, and so Gossett went to Guinness and said, we, we, we know this works in our factory. Um, it's great for us, but I really think it can make a general impact on the rest of the world. We should publish this. And Guinness had a general, uh, uh, they had like an NDA, like you, you could not publish under your name at Guinness. And so what Gossett uh, got Guinness to agree to um, informally uh, was that he could publish the t-test, but he had to publish it under a pen name. And so he published it under the name student. And so he published a paper on the t-test under the name student, not under his, his name, William Seeley Gossett. So now looking back, we know it was William Seeley Gossett who created the t-test, but at that time it was published uh, anonymously under the name student. And that's where we got students t-test. Now, I've been frustrated with the name student because I feel like when you learn it, you think it's just like um, uh, something that you're, it was, was it developed just for classes, like just for you, the students, and it doesn't actually have any real world use. But it turns out it's, it's every time you use a confidence interval, you're implicitly using a t-test. It's extremely influential. And the student just had to do with the fact that, um, that Guinness had basically a non-disclosure agreement and, uh, and none of its employees can publish under their own name. So they publish under student. 
Um, so it became very popular. And then um, this guy named Fisher got involved. So Fisher was a mathematician who just adored um, Gossett's tea test. Gossett was not a mathematician. Gossett was really humble. And he always claimed that if, if he hadn't come up with a tea test, Fisher would have would eventually have figured it out on his own. Uh, but Fisher um, was deferent to Gossett. So these two sort of became um, uh, a kind of a force together. Um, but they were largely a force that was sort of against these other folks you may have heard of, like um, like Pearson, for example, so other big stats names. So you got these two camps and they largely were the large statistics camps and the small statistics camps. And today with AI and machine learning, we're getting them back. The large statistics camps are the new AI people and the machine learning and the small statistics camps are the, the statisticians and the industrial engineers. And so in the end, they yell at each other about who's doing things right. But in the end, it's just how much data you have. If you have a whole lot of data, maybe you don't need to worry about doing t-tests. So just things to keep in mind moving forward. So, um, so the one sample t-test, how does it work and why does it have all of these assumptions that we need to make sure are met beforehand? So a t-test is we're gonna have a hypothesis that we have data that we're collecting and our hypothesis, and a hypothesis is an answer to a question. And this question that's being uh, asked here is what is the average value of a population? A hypothesis is an answer to that. The answer is I am saying the average value for this population is mu. That is my hypothesis. And the t-test is a test the predictions of that, where you're saying, assuming that hypothesis is true, what would we predict would actually come out if we measured data from the population? And the t-test helps us test those predictions. So um, what you're doing in the t-test is you take an average of a bunch of samples from the population and you turn them all in to one sample. So that we view it as a one sample t-test because it, we're taking a single sample mean. So there's a real average out there that is our hypothesis and we're testing the hypothesis that our real average is something. And so we are going to take a single sample. We're gonna take 10 data points and take their average. Those 10 data points disappear and they're replaced with a single average. That's why we refer to it as a one sample t-test. If you're comparing two populations to each other, um, then you might have a Y bar here or a Y hat here and an X hat over here. And that would become a two sample because I've got an average from one uh, population and a sample average from another population. One sample, two samples. That's the two sample t-test. This here is the one sample t-test. And so um, what the t-test says here is that if the data that you drew to go into this Y bar were independently drawn and they were drawn from a normal distribution with our hypothetical mean. So again, if our hypothesis is true, then this ugly thing here will be distributed along with the so-called student's T distribution. And this student's T distribution, so what that means is that this quantity here should be distributed across the t distribution. So if you estimate a value from that quantity and it doesn't show up right in the middle of your where you're expecting that t distribution to be, then you've probably encountered something where your hypothesis is not true. And so that's what we'll see here in a second. So where do these assumptions come from? And so, um, and, and I just am driving this home because before you use a t-test, you always have to check for independence and normality. Independence, you usually know because you know something about how your data were sampled. Normality, you usually have to run a separate test to do. So, and so I'm trying to drive home, we've got to check for these. So this is why independence and normality are important. So if we assume that our hypothesis is true, that the, that the, that the, the hypothetical mean that we've asserted is true is, is actually the real mean, um, then under that hypothesis, we're also making the assumption that every data point we draw from the population is independently drawn from all of the other data points. And so, um, and so under those assumptions there, if we look at the 10 data points that we have here and how we took its average, that's how we get our single sample. 
Now we can analyze the statistics of this single sample, this y hat, given that these assumptions are true. If all of the data points are drawn independently, um, and if all of the data points are drawn from our hypothetical normal distribution with this average and some variance, then we know that the expected value of our sample mean is just going to be equal to our hypothetical mean. That's something that um, you can just work through the math here is that because this is a sum, the expected value of the sums is going to be the sum of the expectations because the expected value is linear, again, from 380 and 385. And so you get n copies of an average that's divided by n, and that gives you the sample. So we expect under the null hypothesis to be centered right on the mean. And so we can center by subtracting out the mean, and then this quantity we expect to be centered right on zero. So we're building up where this t distribution comes from. The other thing that we're interested in is the variance. And so the variance of this single mean here is just gonna be the variance of this sum over here. Now, if under the assumption of independence, then we know that the variance of sums can actually be decomposed into a, a function of the individual variances of the things that go into the sum. And so I know that the um, variance of this thing is just n times the variance of each individual thing going into the sum. And I know that the variance of each thing, individual thing going into the sum is just going to end up being um, the, um, the variance of the thing in the numerator here divided by n. And so, um, and divided by n squared, because with variances, you end up taking a square you multiply that out by the end again, and then you end up finding that the variance of the mean here is just the variance of the individual things divided by n. So we have a way that under the null hypothesis, we can uh, solve for the mean and variance of this thing. And if I take the standard deviation of that mean, then I get the so-called standard error of the mean, which again is something that I'm hoping you remember from 380. The standard error of the mean is a measure of dispersion of the estimator of the sample mean. So if I took 10 data points and took a mean, I'm going to get some mean. If I take another 10 data points and then recalculate the mean, I'll get another mean. If I take another 10 data points to calculate mean, I'll get another mean. And then these things, uh, I get a bunch of different estimates of the mean. So that in itself forms a distribution. And the standard error of that distribution of sample means is sigma divided by square root of n. So that's where that standard error of the mean comes from, this derivation. So that will end up being an important quantity for us later, that standard error of the mean. All right, so looking at all of that, then I know that I've got a mean for this ugly thing, and I've got a standard deviation for this ugly thing. I also know that this ugly thing is just a sum. Now, I also know from the central limit theorem that if you take the number of elements in a sum as it goes to infinity, the sum itself um, goes to uh, the, the distribution of the sum itself. Um, sorry, I need to um, respond to something here. This, the distribution of the sum itself uh, goes to a normal distribution. So, if you take, remember that, that if I take 10 samples, um, you know, I generate a sample mean, I take another 10 samples, a, a sample mean, another 10 samples, sample mean, and so on. I do that over and over and over again. Then um, if I, instead of taking 10 samples, I take a million samples, and then I do a million samples, and then another million samples, and another million samples, and then I take all of those. As I get more and more samples in each, in each individual calculation of my sample mean, the distribution of the sample mean will go to a normal distribution. And that normal distribution will have the mean that I solved for and the standard deviation that I solved for on the previous page. So um, what that tells me is that I can generate by dividing this quantity by this quantity, what, so that's what I do when I calculate the T statistic. If I have a large number of samples, what I'm just calculating is a Z score. I'm just calculating a standard normal. 
I know that for large numbers of samples, this thing is going to be distributed like a standard normal. And so for any data that I, uh, that I, I put into here, I can then use a Z test to see if the data that I gathered are significantly different from the standard normal. And if they are, then that means that, that, my, that the real life is significantly different than my hypothetical mean. So that is the inspiration for the t-test, but it only works at large numbers of data, at large samples. So um, what does the t-distribution look like for small samples? That's what Gossett's innovation was, is he was able to solve for, this, for the t-distribution, which is the distribution of this quantity when you only have a small number of samples going into that calculation of the mean. And what that looks like is that for, um, for example, right here, the, the blue line is the standard normal. The red line right here, that is the T distribution when you calculate it using only two samples. And so that's supposed, that's basically only, we say that's only with one degree of freedom. And so you can see that it's, shorter than a standard normal, and it is fatter on the tails than a standard normal. It's kind of lifted up on the tails and brought down. If you add in additional samples, so now two degrees of freedom, that means that I would calculate that T statistic with three sample points. I, I uh, there are three data points, I take their average. And if I did that over and over again, then the distribution of the sample means would end up being according to this thick red line. And you can see the tails have been pulled down and the middle has been lifted up. And if I keep doing that, as I get more and more data, then what you find is that the T distribution becomes the Z distribution. So small sample statistics become large sample statistics. So that's what the T distribution is, is it's just a way to use our normal intuition with, which can usually only be used when you gather lots and lots of data. It allows you to import that normal distribution, that z-score uh, intuition into when you only have a little bit of data. It tells you what the kind of stand-in for the standard normal would be. And so we refer to this as a pivotal quantity, um, this, this T distribution, since it only depends on the degrees of freedom, which is basically the number of samples. So for any hypothesis on the mean of a normal, then the T has the same distribution. And so um, every sample corresponds, um, so every sample mean corresponds to a point in this T distribution. And so if you have a very rare value of your T value that shows up in this distribution, then that means that your the, the sample mean you got from real data is probably very, very, very unlikely given that your hypothesis was true. And you just have to keep in mind that your hypothetical, your hypothesis is requires you to assume that your data are normally distributed and your hypothesis is on the mean of that distribution. So that's why you must guarantee that the data that you're looking at are normally distributed and then you're only making an inference on that mean. If your data are not normally distributed, you can't use a t-test. You have to use another sort of test, and we will talk about that as we keep moving forward. All right, so, um, so that's basically for a t-test. If I go back to this picture, this blue curve would, the t-distribution would take the place of this blue curve. And any other normal distribution that has a mean other than my hypothesized distribution would generate a T statistic whose curve would be way out here, shifted over to the right. And so the more data I get, the farther over this red curve will be shifted. So that's one way I get more statistical power is by taking more data, is that separates these two curves. Um, another way to view it is I get more data, you can kind of view it as the um, that T distribution shape kind of gets narrower, but because it's a pivotal quantity, the, the narrowing of it, because you're dividing by that standard error of the mean, is actually forcing the hypothetical t distribution away from the alternative t distribution. So the alternative one just keeps getting pushed away, and that's what improves your numbers up here. <laughs>
So that's the outline of the T distribution and why I want it to be burned into your brain. You can only use a T test if they're independently drawn samples and if they, you can confirm that they come from a normal distribution. Are there questions about that? Hopefully I haven't lost too many of you, but um, but it's important to know you can't do it. You can't just blindly use a t-test. You've got to use. Um, you might want to go downstairs. You might um, that you if you just get two data sets and you want to compare the means. If they're not normally distributed, you have to use um, a non-parametric uh, test, which we'll talk about um, as we move forward. Um, you can't use a t-test. And so you can only use a t-test if you've done another test, like a Levine's test, in order to guarantee that, that those data are normally distributed. All right, so um, with all of that in mind, explain this joke. So take a second here and, um, and, and tell me why this is funny. So this is a Halloween outfit that was worn by a particular grad student named Neil Gilbert, uh, and, um, and he made it himself. And so you can see the t-shirt here, it says student down here, and it's got this kind of symmetric curve in the middle here. So, um, uh, you know, so I'm wondering, you know, so explain what's going on, what is the joke here? Why is this a funny t-shirt for kind of somebody who's a little bit geeky? Uh, and my hint is like, is this a normal student? And I would say it's not a normal student. So what's the joke here? Anybody, take a, a second. In fact, maybe just to keep everybody awake, uh, let's do an um, attendance exercise. Um, so I'll put this up here and I'll put the joke back here. So um, the link to the attendance exercise is in here and uh, give me your interpretation of the joke. Um, and, uh, and I'll put, so the attendance link, which is up here in the video, um, I've also put down here in um, the chat and I will go back and show Neil's shirt here. So, you know, what's your guess? Why is this funny? And after you've put it in, uh, given me your guess of uh, what's going on here in the attendance exercise, then feel free to share in the chat or uh, over the microphone your interpretation of this. And if it's helpful, um, I can show you then the full picture. He's actually holding a box of tea and a Guinness beer. So what's the joke, anybody? Have I lost you all? So we, we learned t-tests in 380, we'll never use them. I can wait. Anybody? Okay. All right, I'm getting some I'm getting some plausible answers, which I like that. You're making some inferences. That's good. That's what this class is all about, inferential statistics. And so, yeah, so I'm getting some answers here about um, t-tests and, uh, and, and I, you can, what, if you keep that, you keep going and you'd say, well, it's on a shirt, then what you've got here is a student's t-shirt, right? So it's, uh, you know, student's t-shirt. Um, so that's the idea here. It's a shirt with the T distribution on it. And he's a student because he's a grad student, um, you know, student, so student's distribution, not a normal student. It's not a normal, it's uh, the tails are too high. So it's a t-shirt, you know, student's t-shirt. 
Um, but with the also the the tip there that um, you know that he's got the William Gossett links here. Um, so uh, so the the T here is you know because of a T test, and uh, and then the Guinness here because William C uh, Henry William Seely Gossett was an employee at Guinness, and um, and so T shirt T test. So there you go. So. Um, that's what we've got here. Not a normal student, a T student, students T, students T shirt. So I'm hoping to get there. Hopefully, I don't, I, I like to give this joke in person because then I get audible groans, which I enjoy. Um, so, um, so it's sad to me that I hear silence because I'm sure some of you were disappointed in this joke and that would have made me a little bit happy inside. Um, so, uh, so yeah, so burn that into your head, the T-test, independence, normality, William Seeley Gossett, et cetera. All right, um, so um, what if normality does not hold? So, the, so you gain more statistical power whenever you can make an assumption on your data ahead of time. So, um, so if you can, look at a bunch of data, you can run a test like an F test or a Levine's test. And I'll refer to the Levine's test a few times. Um, and, that, um, and the Levine's test has high statistical power for testing for normality or the, um, I'm sorry, I, I've said Levine's test. I meant the Shapiro-Wilk. Um, so not Levine's test. Levine's test is for uh, two sample tests, which we'll get to later. Uh, but a Shapiro-Wilk test um, is, got high statistical power for normality. And so with a Shapiro-Wilk test with very little data, if it doesn't reject normality, you can feel pretty confident that it looks normal. If you combine that with a QQ plot and it lines up on the line for normality, then it is okay to go forward with your t-test. And so if you then you go forward with the t-test and the normality that you have assumed gives you far more statistical power in your t-test. If you cannot assume a, a normality, you technically cannot use a t-test. It turns out that a t-test still does pretty good um, even when you don't have normality, but you can't trust the alpha that you've put in there. So, um, so it doesn't work as designed. If you don't have normality, there are um, uh, the, the Mann-Whitney u-test. It's a u-test, like it comes after t. So you can think about that. If I have, if it's non-normal and I wanna do the same thing as a t-test, I use a u-test. So I'm not gonna go into the details of a u-test in this class, but I want you to know that out in the real world, it is very common for you to run into data that aren't normally distributed, but you still need to do a test of means or test of medians. And so you can then Google for non-parametric t-test and the non-parametric t-test that will come up most likely will be the Mann-Whitney u-test. And we refer to a t-test as a parametric test because it is a hypothesis about the parameters of the assumed distribution. When you don't assume a distribution and then you're not making a hypothesis about parameters, your hypothesis is more general than that. And that is why these are non-parametric tests. That's the name we give to those. All right, so that's what I'm summarizing down here. Before you apply a parametric test, be sure that you meet your distribution assumption. So for the t-test, do a Shapiro-Wilk to make sure it is a normal, and then do a QQ plot to then double check that it actually does really look normal. If both of those things come out supporting the normal, you can move on forward with the t-test. I am not gonna require those steps in this class, um, but I do want you to at least um, take a histogram of your data if you can and try to see if it looks like it is plausibly normal. If there's indications that it doesn't look at all normal, then I don't want you to be using a t-test, but, um, but I, I, it's kind of outside of the scope of the tech, this class for me to force that. But if you go out into the real world, if you start applying t-tests to any data set you find, then you're gonna get a talking to. So, um, so, so be careful about that. All right. Um, so um, the example that kind of comes from the homework is what if I want to connect, uh, co uh, compare real data and simulated system data? And so why would you want to do this? I've simulated a system that I that is supposed to be a surrogate for the real world. And so then I uh, want to compare the output from the sim system 
to the real world output in order to validate the uh, simulation model. And so what I'm gonna do to do that in this particular case is instead of generating random arrivals to my system, let's say that's simulating, uh, a, I don't know, orders, instead of generating orders at a job shop, instead of simulating random orders, I'm gonna take real orders um, from real, real world input data and feed them into my simulation and then compare the performance I get out of my simulation to the performance that came out of those real data in the real system. And so that's something that you're gonna see like on your homework in the second part of your homework. Now, um, a one sample t-test is what we use to evaluate uh, that a, that, so one sample t-test is what we use to evaluate that a difference is, so, so normally, okay, what I'm trying to say here is normally if I have two populations, simulated population, real world population, if I wanna say, do these two populations agree in me? Then I would usually use a two sample t-test. And so I would calculate a mean from one population, a mean from the other population and compare those two sample means. Now, you don't get a lot of statistical power from a two sample t-test. And so an alternative is if you can pair the outputs and by pairing the outputs, I mean, you run the same input into the two systems so that for every input you run into one system and you get an output, you get an output from the other system that is related to the other output. If you can relate those two outputs, you can pair them together and take their differences. And then those differences become a single population. And in that case, you're testing the inference for is the mean of the single population equal to zero? And if it's equal to zero, um, then, uh, then your hypothesis that the two uh, populations, your original populations have same means is going to be supported. But if instead you reject the hypothesis that your differences have a zero mean, then in that case, um, you have to conclude that your two, your simulated population, your real population are different. And so um, that's the idea of pairing. You pair to get more statistical power. And by pairing the outputs, you go from a two sample t-test to a one sample t-test. And so the example that you did in the book is similar to, or that you're gonna do on the homework is similar to this one. You've got a system output, a simulation output. Um, you're not gonna do the uh, two sample t-tests uh, because each simulated output was generated with the same input data as the uh, real system output. And so these two are not independently drawn. So you can't use a two sample. So instead you calculate differences and all of these differences are independent from each other. So you can use a one sample t-test on these differences. And so you go through, through and you calculate the mean difference and the, um, and the standard deviation or the variance of the differences. And that allows you to calculate a t-statistic where your hypothetical, uh, uh, your hypothesis is that this population has a mean of zero. And so that turns this T statistic into this simple quantity here, which is just the mean difference divided by the standard error of the mean, which is down here. And that's the T statistic for this population. And so in the homework, we also ask you to figure out um, details about how many of these samples, how many differences you need in order to make a conclusion. And what we um, say is that you need a, is that we want you to detect a particular size of difference. And so in the homework, it says it's important for you to detect a two uh, unit difference in output from the simulated system and the real system. And so that becomes this uppercase D here. If it's less than two, then we're willing to say our simulated system is close enough to our real system. But if it's more than two, we need to detect that because that means we need to fix our simulation. So that's what we mean by detect that we see a two unit difference in the output performance. And so in order for us to calculate a so-called effect size, we normalize that difference by the standard deviation we see in our pilot data. And that gives us a so-called effect size. And with that effect size, we can then calculate how many samples 
we need in order to be confident that if this difference exists, we're going to catch it with our experiment. And so to do that, you refer to these operating characteristic curves, which are slightly different than the ROC curves I introduced earlier. It's a different type of operating characteristic. And so this one plots the effect sizes um, against the type two error. And it does that for different levels of type one error. So in the back of the book, you can say for a type one error of 5%, you've got this operating characteristic curve. For a type one error of 1%, you've got this operating characteristic curve. And so if I zoom in on the one that's for the 5% um, type one error, then I get these curves, which again are plotting my effect size on the x-axis, and they're plotting my type two error on the y-axis. So if I tell you, you must have an 80% statistical power, 80% so statistical power is this formula up here. It's just one minus beta, one minus type two error. 80% statistical power means a 20% type two error. So that means I wanna hit this line at 20% down here. And so if I then tell you that I need you to detect a two unit difference, and I know that the standard deviation of my differences is, uh, let's say it happens to also be two units, then I'm trying to detect an effect size of one, two divided by two is equal to one. So that tells me that my, I need to be looking at this vertical line, an effect size of one. And what this curve tells me here is it tells me, if I annotate, it tells me that for an effect size, there we go, for an effect size of one, which is this line here, and a statistical power of 80%, which is a type two error of 20%, then that tells me that I am at this point right in the middle here, and that lands on the operating characteristic curve that corresponds to taking 10 samples. So if I take more than 10 samples, then I get even more statistical power. So more than 10 samples allows me to have an even smaller type two error rate. Less than 10 samples increases my type two error rate. So it decreases my statistical power. So what this curve tells me is that if I want at least 80% uh, statistical power, or in other words, at most 20% type two error, I need to take at least 10 samples. And so that's how you do a power analysis for that. So it's easy to do a power analysis for a t-test. It gets much more complicated for chi-squared tests and other tests. And so there are tools out there like G-Power, which I'll put in the chat there, that if you go on and do this for a profession, you're going to have to do power analyses, but you go on and you run fancy tools like G-Power that are able to calculate, do power analyses for a wide variety of tests. Even in the case of t-tests and a couple of other common tests, um, tools like R and MATLAB have built-in tools within them that will do this power analysis for you. Okay, so, um, so that's kind of getting us up to date with uh, power analyses and t-tests and such. So are there questions about any of that, about the t-test or about um, how to, uh, you know, when to use paired t-tests versus two sample t-tests and, um, and how to do this power analysis for a t-test, how to use those operating characteristic curves, what effect size is, is all this clear? All right, so um, let's do another quick attendance exercise. So again, I'll put the link in the chat and the question here that I'll give is um, uh, if I want uh, more statistical power, do I sample more or less? So the answer here I'm looking for is either a more or a less. If I want more statistical power, do I take more samples or less samples? Okay. 
Okay, so um, moving forward here, then uh, I do want to cover um, the, in the bottom half here, the last 10 minutes here, um, a similar discussion of where the heck do the assumptions for the chi-squared test come from. So um, remember the chi-squared test uh, helps you compare expected numbers of counts of count data with observed numbers of counts of count data. So like uh, if you've got discrete data, um, how many things arrived, uh, you know, frequency distributions of arrivals, for example. So, you know, I got, um, you know, 12 cases where only one person arrived in a 10 minute interval, but 15 cases where two people arrived and so on and so forth. So you've got these count data and you've got an expected number of counts and you've got a, a, an expected distribution of counts versus an actual distribution of counts. And you wanna compare them and you do this chi-squared, which uh, by now we're all familiar with how to do. Um, and so where the heck does like, for example, the restriction that you have to have at least five um, in your expected counts per bin? Well, if we break this chi-squared test into the two bin case where you just have um, counts basically um, do I get a count in a bin or out of a bin? Basically, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's basically a one bin count, in, but it's like in the bin or out. You know? so, so I'm only focusing on, on two outcomes, in or out. And I'm gonna be wondering how many of those. Then my chi-squared test becomes this simple, or my chi-squared statistic becomes this simple thing down here. So there's my two bins and this simple thing down here. So, um, so I say, well, how would I uh, test? I you know test that I've got the expected distribution across these two bins. Well, if you only have two bins, you don't have to use a chi-squared test. You can use um, uh, basically a binomial test. So a binomial tells you that um, you know it's got two parameters n and p. So for the total number of data that I have, what is the hypothetical probability that they will land in one of the bins? Uh, one bin, and then the rest of that, so one minus p is the probability that they'll land in the other bin. So, um, it, so it turns out that the, so the expected number of counts in the bin is just going to be n times p, and the expected number of counts out of the bin will just be n times one, one minus p. And so, um, so again, you don't have to use a chi-squared, you can use an exact test of uh, a binomial test. But a binomial test um, can be approximated by a normal distribution. And so if you wanted to approximate the binomial, if you have a high value of n times p, so you've got um, a high number of samples or a moderate um, probability that things will land um, in one of the bins, as long as this n times p is sufficiently large, the binomial distribution, which is a discrete distribution, is bell-shaped and looks just like a normal distribution that has this uh, standard DV or this mean and this variance. So that approximation of the binomial by the normal is what is known as a continuity approximation. You are approximating a binomial, which is a discrete distribution by a continuous distribution. So, for um, if you have M observed obs uh, uh, successes with um, this average value N times P sufficiently large, then if you define this quantity right here, this is how many counts I actually saw in the bin. This is how many expected to go in the bin. And this down here is the standard deviation of that distribution of how many things go in the bin. This right here is just a z-score. It's a standardized score for my approximated normal distribution. But that z-score is only a good approximation for a binomial if your NP is sufficiently large. And it turns out that sufficiently large means um, NP greater than or equal to five. And so this is a hint of where the five is gonna come from in the chi-squared distribution. So it turns out that in the chi-squared distribution, we're effectively um, doing a bunch of repeated cases of turning every bin from a binomial test into a z-test, into a z-score. And we can only do that if we have an average number of expected you know, an expected number in each bin of five or more. That's when this continuity approximation applies.
So I can generalize this from two bins. And so I can go to, um, so I can uh, go down here. Um, what I, I've got down here is I've taken um, the square of my standardized z-score. And if I take that square of that standardized z-score, so now it's just the square difference divided by the variance. And so here, if you remember your partial fraction expansion from like, I don't know, algebra, then this thing is equal to the sum of these two things. And so that just happens to be just due to the partial fraction expansion. If you look closely, the blue things that are in up top here are the um, number of counts in and out of the bin. So the number of counts in bin one, the number of counts in bin two. And the other thing here are the expected number of counts in bin one. And these are the expected number of counts in bin two. And then the denominator, the expected number of counts in bin one and the expected number of counts in bin two. This is where the chi-squared statistic comes from. It comes from a partial fraction expansion of a squared standard normal. That's just, it's just in the math from the partial fraction expansion. So it looks weird in the chi-squared test to be dividing a square by something that looks like it should be squared, but you don't because it comes from this partial fraction expansion. And so we can generalize this. Uh, so this is just saying what I just said before, uh, in the last slide, and that's for two bins. If we go forward, we can actually do it for um, any number of bins. And what you end up coming out with is that for, um, for K numbers of bins, it's you have K minus one degrees of freedom. So in other words, um, you always have a slack bin. So for, K number of bins, that last bin is just whatever's left over in your total sample count. That's what gives you K minus one degrees of freedom. And so it turns out that a chi-squared statistic is the sum of K minus one squared standard normals. And so that's where the test distribution comes from in the chi-squared statistic. So some clever folks realized this and they were able to, to define this chi-squared statistic. And so for multiple bins, the, the, this chi-squared statistic is, um, which looks like this here. So this shape of the chi-squared statistic is basically the sum of that many standard normals. And so the sum of that many squared standard normals. And so the yellow line here, this very peaked one, is if you took a standard normal, which would be a bell curve, and you square all those, so you make them all positive, then you get an all negative ski slope like this one. Um, likewise for uh, two, this is like if you take two standard normals, square them and add them together, the distribution, which will always be a positive number, is gonna be this green one. As it gets higher and higher, the chi-squared test looks more and more like a bell curve. And that's because you're summing up more and more and more, and that's moving this hump over until eventually, the, just like the t-test, as you get a high number of degrees of freedom, the chi-squared test appro appro uh, um, approaches a normal distribution. And so that's uh, kind of what's happening here. So that's where the chi-squared test comes from. And that's the reason why you need to have a, at least five in your expected counts per bin. It's to make this continuity assumption that turns a binomial into a standard normal. So in our picture here, and I think this is the last kind of topic that I'll plan to cover today, um, this generic blue uh, curve here, which is our hypothetical distribution, in the chi-squared case, it's one of these distributions. So under your hypothetical, um, under your hypothesis that that distribution that you've assumed is true, then the data that you get out um, from your chi-squared should take on one of these shapes. And depending on how much data, that's when you depend on the shape. And those shapes, fit into this blue hump over here. So turn this hump into one of those shapes instead. If it comes from a different distribution, then the chi-squared statistic that you, uh, that you gather will fall into a different distribution like the distribution over here. But there's gonna be a similar story about where they overlap and where they don't, and that will generate the false positives and the true positives for your chi-squared test. And it's resulting type one error and statistical power. And so setting the alpha value, which is setting that threshold in your chi-squared test, if you sweep the alpha, you're also going to change the beta 
and uh, in the exact same way. And that's because the chi-squared behind the scenes has a picture just like this one. So that's where all of these things come from. All right, we're at time. And so that's where I'm going to stop. So let's do um, one last attendance question. Um, and I'll put up, uh, and I'm happy to take a couple of questions if anybody's got them. Otherwise, that's all the, uh, the stuff I've got. So the question for today is um, what, um, uh, what is a binomial distribution approximated by um, under the hood of a chi-square test? So a chi-square test is effectively a test built on um, binomial tests, but you can't, uh, the, but using the binomial test is mathematically ugly. So instead they replace the binomial test with a, the binomial test with a different type of test. So what is being approximated there? You're approximating the binomial by something else, and that approximation in order to do that is the reason why we have to make this five uh, assumption in a chi-squared test. All right, so that's all I've got today, kind of an overview of where those assumptions come from. If there's any questions, I'm happy to take them. Otherwise, uh, that's uh, all the formal content that I've got for you. So you're also free to go. And as I said before, hap p value Halloween. All right, so of those that hang on or hung on there, um, are there any other questions? Anything I can help with? Or are you just hanging around in case someone else has got a question? All right, well, in that case, I will uh, end the meeting and see everybody next week. Have a good weekend.